XRP, XRP, XRP. The Bulls are getting ready to run out the gates, family. Can't you feel it? Hi, Vibe Assets. Welcome back to today's show. I got a good one for you today. You know every time that you click on this channel, the content is going to be bullish. Go ahead and give me a follow on my Twitter page at High Vibe Assets. Without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off today's show. So I'm, I'm super positive that um, it's going to have two really positive impacts from, from an investment standpoint. Number one, it will clear the path for banks to utilize ODL, on-demand liquidity, mm -hmm. because there will be no regulatory burden or liability associated with their buying and selling XRP in the course of using ODL, right? Right. And that, what, what does that mean? It means that there will be significantly more demand for XRP and the amount of trading liquidity around XRP will significantly increase. And the second really material benefit is that it will significantly increase the value of the XRP escrow that yeah. Ripple holds. So Ripple will benefit, A, because it will have much greater market adoption for its payment processing product, more customers, more revenues from those customers, but also the intrinsic value of the escrow will increase. Those two things are significant investment drivers for Ripple stock. This is coming from straight from the mouth of the chief of operations at Link2, telling us what I've been saying on this channel for the last eight to nine months. Ripple and XRP is at the center. It is the heartbeat of the fourth industrial revolution. You see, we are leaving out of the age of what we're talking about, the Internet of Information. The reason why we get to get on these radio waves, streaming, all things telecommunications. The Internet, what it made for us and what it made for humanity to be able to communicate on a level was changed our lives essentially. This is the moment and this is the time to where the same thing that happened with information is now happening with value and money. All of the banks are going to use XRP. All of the banks are going to use on-demand liquidity and there is no more regulatory burden upon XRP. Is it a security? Can these companies and these institutions and banks, can they go out and purchase XRP and sell XRP? What about the on-demand liquidity product, what XRP is created for? This is the last opportunity family that you have to catch XRP for under a dollar. Once we get a major bank, a major governmental agency, no more non-disclosures agreements, no more backdoor deals, no more documents that we have to dig up and old videos that we have to prove that these things are true. Once they come out live family and tell us that they're using XRP and on-demand liquidity, you will never have to work again in your damn lives. That's how we gonna start off today's show family, extra bullish. You know every time that you come on this channel, this is what it is. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button. This is generational wealth on what we're talking about. We've been here since 2017. Some of you have been here since 2015. OGs oh, in the game. We've been through these market cycles. We've been through these narratives multiple times. As you can see what the XRP price is doing, it is continuing to have the strength because it is the only digital asset in the world that has clarity, not a security, on paper by a federal judge. This is the last opportunity that you have to purchase XRP for under a dollar. Yeah, you may have heard that before. Yeah, somebody else may have said that, but continue to wait on the sidelines. As we just heard Link 2's COO tell us that this clears the way, this clears the path to on-demand liquidity. You're talking about Fed now, all of a sudden they're going live, just perfect timing. ISO 2022, they had their head start. Swift openly has said that they're going to use XRP on their platforms 
for on-demand liquidity to operate as a currency. The Federal Reserve is going to let launch Fed now real-time payments as early as tomorrow. The network, which has been under development for nearly four years, represents the regulator's first effort to create a nationwide network for instant payments, a service that other countries, at least one other major U.S. processor, have developed over the last decade. We know for a fact that Fed now is partnered with Ripple Partners to create their on-demand liquidity product, real-time gross settlement systems. We know this. XRP is the only asset that can be used at this moment for digital assets. Gary Gensler, long as I checked, he's still the commissioner at the SEC. You think he's about to stop? These other digital assets and these tokens are about to go under the same amount of scrutiny that Ripple and XRP did. You see, the banks are going to use no matter what it is. Small banks, regional banks, big conglomerates, International Monetary Fund, Bank of International Settlement, SWIFT, ISO 2002, MoneyGram, Western Union, whatever it is, whatever financial institution that it is, the banks are are going to use what is efficient and cheaper. Absolutely, without a doubt. That's just business one-on-one. If you deliver a better product at a better price, they're going to use it. What's another digital asset that's better than XRP? What's coming at a better price than XRP is saving millions, billions of dollars per year just in transaction fees alone? Everyone needs to buckle up, okay? Everyone inside of this crypto community, especially if you're an XRP holder, because with XRP, the greatest digital asset ever created, it's merged with the Amazon of crypto. Let's not forget about Ripple's liquidity hub service that is now primed for programmatic sales of XRP, and all of the banks in the United States are going to use it. You see, Judge Annalisa Torres, when she came out with that ruling, it gave the green light for Ripple Service Liquidity Hub so they can now have programmatic sales of XRP to build up their liquidity pools. Indeed, the world. This is not just news. This is not just something that we're saying. We have seen this narrative time and time again, right? Let's go back to the point to where we were talking about the programmatic sales of XRP. What is it going to do to the XRP ledger? You have to understand, when Judge Torres said that those things are not a security, all it did was open up the floodgates for Ripple's liquidity hub. I told everyone when those Bill Hinman emails came out, I said that this distributed ledger technology space will never be the same again. By not having a securities contract on programmatic sales of XRP, that means on-demand liquidity product, that means it's a go. What it means is all of the companies that have been running their pilots, all the companies that have been running behind the scenes with Ripple, Ripple has been building out the railroads and building out infrastructures on all of these institutional back-end systems, right? Ripple has been doing this for a couple of years now, but they've been on their fiat-based system. David Schwartz told us that this day was going to happen. Brad Garlinghouse told us that this day was going to happen. When the industry was ready, they were going to flip the switch from their fiat-based services to on-demand liquidity. A lot of the public discourse is around the question of whether uh, XRP is a security or not. There are other issues here that I think are intellectually maybe even more intriguing and may even be more outcome determinative. Let me give you an example. There's a Supreme Court opinion called Morrison, and it basically says that the federal securities laws are designed to apply to transactions that occur in the United States. And there's a strong judicial presumption against the extraterritorial application of U.S. law. And the lower courts have a variety of different doctrines to try to figure out when a transaction actually occurs in the United States. So one rule of thumb is, well, you know, is, does the transaction close in the United States? Well, 
here's what's interesting. If you wind up transacting in XRP on a foreign exchange, that's not in the United States. So to the extent that XRP transactions are occurring elsewhere, right, before I say, whether it's a security or not doesn't make a difference. The SEC can't reach it. Right. Yeah, more intriguing. What does it mean to confirm a transaction on a blockchain the way XRP is structured, which is a consensus mechanism, and it's an 80% consensus mechanism? Well, what does that mean? Suppose the node that gets you across 80% is located in Iceland. Well, does that transaction occur in the United States? Mm. Suppose that all of the nodes right, that confirm the transaction are outside the United States. Suppose that, you know, 50% of the node, I mean, we don't know. And then here's a separate question. And, and here, you know, I just, I just don't know how, how the coding and pro- is it possible to look at the history of that blockchain and try to figure out where it was confirmed, who confirmed it and who the confirming nodes were? I, I have to go back and look at that. The burden of proof is on the plaintiff. Mm. And if you can't determine where this happened, how do you establish where the transaction actually closed? So, so it may be that even if you decide that this is a security, and that's going to be hotly litigated, the SEC may not be able to reach transactions unless it can prove that they occurred in the United States. And given the architecture of the system, it may not be able to do that. Right. So you're talking about blowing this thing out of the water, family. We have to understand that. What Ripple and XRP is doing, they're solving multi-trillion dollar problem, family. We're not talking about anything small. This is the real deal. $250 trillion cross-border payment sector to reach that by 2027, powered by Ripple, powered by XRP, powered by the XRP ledger, powered by on-demand liquidity. Again, we know for a fact that SWIFT is moving 25 trillion dollars per day in volume iso 2022 is going to be doing the same thing this is a massive explosion once in a lifetime opportunity family if you're sitting on the sidelines if you ain't adding to those bags you need to grab you one multi-trillion dollar problem and it seems like cryptocurrencies are just naturally suited to make payments better. And it's specifically, we kind of focused on cross-border international payments, not because domestic payments are great, but because it's, it's their cross-border payments are the worst. Like if you, anyone who's made an international payment probably has stories of, of bad experiences. And so the worse the thing you start with, the less amazing you have to be to be better. And I think like, I think we can eventually be amazing and sort of take over the payments world, but we're not going to be there day one. And so we, if we can't, you know, if we can't succeed against the worst part of the problem, why are we, why are we bothering? And so that was kind of the very earliest focus. And I think that kind of matured between 2011 and 2014, this kind of focus of like, we really need to solve payments. This is one thing that I want everybody to understand again, all of the banks are going to use XRP on-demand liquidity product, which is going to have all of the volume being pumped out of the inner ledger protocol. We understand these things. We've been covering this for so long on this channel. This is the reason why the price of XRP is continuing to rise at the moment. These things, this price, it'll never go down as we have more breaking news that the United States Senate introduced a bill to regulate DeFi like traditional banking institutions. Why is that important? You know, most people may look at that and think that that's not actually a good thing. This is regulation. This is clarity. This is setting up for XRP to come and take the number one spot. When you see that DeFi is being regulated like a traditional banking institution, that means the traditional banks are bringing their trillion dollars under assets management. They're bringing it. And they're not coming with a short bag either. They're coming with everything that they have. Fed now, the first new payment rail since 40 years. Service providers, 
Banks will not be directly transaction. The service provider performs the transfer. RippleNet, Volante, Finistra, all have been working with the Federal Reserve to help build out this faster payment system that they're using today. I'm not promising anything to anybody. We understand that Fed now is going live, but with on-demand liquidity, they're using these products. XRP is now viable to use with these payment systems. The price of XRP is gonna fly. You know what? Let's, let's talk about Fed now specifically, though. And you know, what's what's the unique opportunity here for banks to start fresh, right? I and mean, we touched on this a bit, but there are things about this is brand new um, that we can talk about, and then maybe a little bit about and and how can we push that into the testing discussion? Like, how can we push people to do things differently on testing specifically? Yeah, um, I mean, what what better time to think about new stuff or modernization of, of testing or of your services and, and technology than the first new payment rail in 40 years. I, I've jazzed about that. <laughs> so what better time to start thinking about this as an opportunity? Um, and, and to your point, you know, even as, as organizations are thinking through budget and um, kind of product rollout, um, thinking about this as a uh, more than you know, a true rail, payment rail, rather than just a new um, product, um, that is really going to be an opportunity to think um, in innovative ways about everything. Um, whether that's the, the use cases that are out there or um, how to test out and ensure that you're operationally ready to go um, with the FedNow service. Um, so absolutely a great time to think about new approaches, technologies, opportunities for innovation. Um, some new approaches may be a, a bit more required. So using the ISO schema, that is, that's absolutely core to um, the FedNow service. So um, adopting that um, ISO messaging standard um, is going to be new for a lot of, a lot of organizations. Um, there's a lot of service providers out there that are ready to support this, um, but it's, it's also new for them as well, potentially, if, if they haven't used it uh, internationally before. Um, but I want to be sure that this isn't seen just because this is new and really big, that this isn't a barrier to, to thinking about the FedNow service or thinking about testing. Because um, like you said, Miriam, you know, older processes, older systems can be looked to, to leverage and to um, get those efficiencies to prevent you from totally recreating the wheel. Um, you know, there may be opportunities for modernizing um, things like the core banking system or things like other payments uh, services, um, but it's not a requirement to, to move into the, the instant payment space. Um, so for some, maybe this is the right time for a wholesale change and update and upgrade for everything, which would be really exciting. Um, but for others, maybe it's, it's kind of step by step, piece by piece um, to look at, at upgrades. And Thanks for everyone tuning in to today's show. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and turn on those notifications. This is not financial advice, and I'm not a financial advisor, but please let everyone know that the high vibe said that the bulls are getting ready to run out the damn gates. Yeah.